Peace, peace, peace. What's going on, everybody? Brother Abdul solving a race problem. At it again with another episode. This is going to be entitled The Myth of the Docile African. And if you're wondering what is that title, what is it about, I'll tell you straightforward. There is a myth that African people have been docile. Docile means that um, you just kind of take what's given to you. You sit in the back. Um, you just kind of let things happen. You're, you're lackluster. You don't really have any fight in you. So docile is calm and all of those things. So I'm saying that there's a myth that African people have been docile throughout our interactions with the dominant society, specifically Europeans. So you could be anywhere on this YouTube campus and you're right here with me. So I definitely appreciate you. Make sure you get out a pen, piece of paper, uh, something to write with, anything like that. As we go into this, I'm going to give you a couple of different examples of black people, African descendants using counter violence to get in a better condition to improve their condition okay so this this notion that you've been fed that africans and black people have just kind of been sitting back and taking beatings and not doing anything about it that is a complete myth that i'm going to dispel today through some of my research and some of the things that i'll present to you so if you're new here go ahead and um uh, subscribe to the channel comment your thoughts anything like that and um, post questions. If you have any, I'll be sure to address address them to the best of my ability. So if I get one view on this video, that's a win for me. If I get one person in this classroom, that is a win for me. So let me go ahead and get right into this information. <clears throat> okay, like I said, this is the myth of the docile African. And I, I want to make something very clear that since we have Come in contact with the European, we have fought on the shores of Africa. We fought the entire way on the ocean. We even fought when we landed. So we fought the entire way, the entire process from the time that they came on the shores of Africa, fought them there, fought them the entire way across the ocean, getting to the quote unquote new world. And we fought them once we got here. Do not let anybody tell you anything other than that. Let's go with one of the first examples. This is San Miguel de Guadalupe. And this was one of the first civilizations of African people coming to the United States. OK, <clears throat> it was initially in 1526. And this was the first rebellion of African slaves within the continental United States. OK, so there were Spanish settlers. They came here. Uh, they started a little set settlement mixed in with Native Americans and Maroon societies. But what ended up happening is the the um, the Spanish settlers, the winter came, so they were real sick. The local tribes were attacking them, and slaves saw that as an opportunity to fight back and get away. So the Spanish settlers came in. The Native Americans that were there didn't like them being there, so the Spanish settlers were sick, going through diseases, trying to fight off the Native Americans that were there. The Black people said, this is our perfect opportunity to rebel and get out of this condition. Black people fought back. Black people, um, you know, were able to kill off most of the settlers there and then they formed their own communities. They formed maroon societies, which is basically equivalent of runaways. So they, they had these, these societies of runaway slaves that sometimes they had some intermixing with the um, Native American settlers, but this was the first non-Native settlement here in the continental United States, which was of African people. So this is a very important and significant moment in history that probably you have never heard of or get swept under the rug. Because even the first Africans who came here, they didn't just willingly um, get beaten, take their punishment. They fought back and won. <laughs> they fought back and won. Like it says right here, this is the first known such rebellion in the future U, uh, United States with slaves, constituting the first non-native settlers. Yeah. <clears throat> so they escaped refuge and they were able to form their own societies after they were able to get out from the European imperialism at the time, which was the Spanish that came over. And that's called San Miguel de Guadalupe, like you have right up there on your screen. 
Another example I'm gonna give you is the Stono Rebellion. And this was a, a slave rebellion in South Carolina. And this was kind of like the catalyst because this sparked more than 30 other rebellions. Like this was like the, the linchpin that sparked it. And then 30 other rebellions like throughout Georgia, throughout South Carolina started after this one, the, the Stono Rebellion. And this was, you know, Africans and, you know, generally from Central Africa. And what they did was it was about 60 slaves and they went plantation to plantation all throughout South Carolina killing slave masters. That's what they did. They saw a problem and they said, we want to get out of this. And how are we going to get out of this? They started to fight back. Like so much so that there was a 10 year moratorium, meaning that for 10 years, the slave ports of South Carolina shut down. Like the slave ports of South Carolina shut down for 10 years because they were scared to come through. They didn't want anything to do with it. They said, these slaves here are crazy. We're not going to be coming here back and forth. It was a 10 year moratorium. It says right here. It also enacted a 10 year moratorium against importing African slaves because they were considered more rebellious. You see? Those slaves that were coming there were considered more rebellious. So they shut the port down for 10 years. So black people fighting back were able to get that port shut down. And this led to the Negro Act of 1740. And at that point, it was like a one to 10 um, ratio for slaves to slave owners. So in other words, for every, um, they made up a new rule that there had to be a one to 10 rule for every 10 black people there needs to be you know, one white person kind of quote unquote watching over them. So this type of thing doesn't happen again because the Stono Rebellion was a reflection that we outnumbered them. Let's take advantage of that. That was in 1739, right up there on your screen. Next one I'm gonna show you about is Gaspar Yanga. Sometimes he just referred to as Yanga and he was a leader of one of the Maroon societies right in Mexico. So this is the person who is known as the man who got Mexico from underneath of Spanish colonialism, from out of European colonialism. This African man liberated Mexico. He did. He was an African leader, Veracruz, Mexico. He's been named the national hero of Mexico. This black man is named the national hero of Mexico. There was a Spanish attack in 1609 in which they won. The colonial government gave them rights to rule themselves. Now, this was an instance in where the colonizers had doubled the troops. They were outmanned and they had guns. They had access to guns that Gaspar Yanga and his Maroon Society did not have. But they relied on strategy. They relied on having a knowledge of the terrain in Mexico. They used machetes and stones, bones and arrows. They only had about 100 guns compared to an entire, you know, European um, imperialist army. And they still won. The African people still won. Gaspar Yang is a national hero in Mexico. Now, will he get the type of recognition that he deserves? Probably not. But they won. Africans won. We're not just docile. They went to war with the Europeans and won. And look, finally, 1618, Yanga achieved an agreement with the colonial government for self-rule of the Maroon settlement. Saying, we beat y'all. We have a right to govern ourselves. Leave us alone. And they did. That, that's exactly what happened. His brother name is Gaspar Yanga. You can go ahead and look him up. Like I was saying, the National Hero of Mexico says it right here. Okay, the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is really important. I know that some people are aware of it, but for those of you that are not, this was in 1804, and it just recently celebrated its um, 
the anniversary of it. And two main figures were uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint Louverture. And this was the first instance in which an entire island was liberated. It's the first black nation, right? Because what they did, they fought all of the major colonial powers at the time, which was the United States, um, the French, the British, like they fought all of those major powers and won. Just like the same thing with Gaspar Yanga, how I just showed you how they were outmanned, outgunned, didn't have the resources, but they relied on strategy. They relied on the knowledge of the terrain. They relied on a willingness to want to get out of oppression. And they won. The Haitians won. Black people won in a war against all of the major powers of the world. Once they lost, once the French lost, they were the main colonizers of this island. Once the French lost, they were in so much debt from everything they were piling into this war, they had to recoup their money by selling something. So what did they have at the time? They had that big piece of what is now the United States. So they sold that which was a Louisiana purchase. The United States doubled after this loss. What the Haitians said after they won is any black person, if you come here, you will live as a free black person. You will not be enslaved. Come here. And black people internationally just kind of looked, kind of spooked. Because if not then, more than ever, that should have been the time to get out of oppression. Should have said, you know what? We see what's happening in this little island in the Caribbean. Black people in America, let's do the same thing. Black people in the UK, let's do the same thing. Black people on the continent, let's do the same thing. But we didn't do that. That's kind of like if you got a, a group of people that you with and you going to, it's a big fight and it's, a, it's another group of people and it's a large group. You got one person who's on your side and say, you know what, let's stop being scared. Let's go over there and fight. They go over there and start swinging on people, and then everybody who came with them just sitting back and watching. That's the equivalent. Black Americans sit back and watch. Black people in the UK sat back and watched. Black people on the continent sat back and watched. While the brothers of Haiti went forward to fight. I'll let that sit on your consciousness. They, they promised all black people freedom and protection. So what they were doing before the revolution popped off, they were meeting in swamps. They were um, conspiring in swamps, doing different spiritual ceremonies. Anybody who was a co-op who was seen as working with the opposition, they killed them. That's a Haitian revolution. Another instance in which black people warned that were not afraid. They, none of them were docile here. Let's go here to 1811 German Coast Uprising. And this was the largest insurgency in US history. So what they did, it was about 120 slaves. They went from plantation to plantation and rounded people up. So some of these sugar plantations, people have said have been some of the worst ones, not that the cotton ones were any better, but they were all horrible. But they were going plantation to plantation. They were rounding up black people to say, if you if you done being afraid and you don't wanna do this anymore, let's do this tonight. So they just went plantation to plantation. They were burning plantations down. They were um, killing white people. And at this time, they were outnumbering whites five to one. Like at this time, the slaves outnumbered whites five to one in 1810. And 90% of those white people there were slave owners. So what they did, they went place to place and this was an example of black self-respect that they were not docile. They were inspired after the Haitian revolution, which was a good thing. What they were trying to do was they were trying to make it to Haiti actually. So they followed the Mississippi river, they collected slaves, they burned everything up along the way. A group of black people tried to do that. And that was the 1811 German coast uprising. 
disproving the myth of the docile African. Your next example is the Baptist War. And this predated some of the first Maroon Wars. And in 1673, there were about 200 slaves or enslaved people. And in about 1690, there were about 400 enslaved people. So in other words, the, the Maroon societies were doubling, like the Maroon societies in the Caribbean, this, this specifically happened in Jamaica, these were getting bigger and bigger. So the Baptist War, which is also known as the Great uh, Jamaican Slave Revolt, it says that it happened in December, the Christmas Rebellion, and it was a black preacher, and the brother's name was Samuel Sharp. So Samuel Sharp, what he did was the things that he was reading in the Bible motivated him to want to get out of oppression. That sounds very similar to what was going on with Nat Turner. Nat Turner read some things in the Bible that said it is time for us to get out of oppression, Samuel Sharp read some things in the Bible that said it's time for us to get out of oppression. Many people who are reading it now don't get that same understanding, but whatever parts that they read that resonated with them, he uh, convinced his entire congregation to fight back. They fought back against the colonial powers, burnt down plantations, and started maroon societies. Now, the, this kind of had an unfortunate ending because the, colon, the colonizer said, you know what, we'll leave you alone. You won, you, you did it, fine, we'll leave you alone. And they sort of had, uh, they formed a treaty. So what they said was, we'll have peace, but you can't accept any new slaves or help catch them. Like the, the colonizers said to them, if you want to have peace, then don't accept any more people into your Maroon society. Which is basically like, don't help more black people get free. Actually, help us catch them and then we'll give you money. You see the moral dilemma that they set up with the people? They set up with the people. They gave them basically two options that if you want to, you know, be here and have peace, you can either one, not recruit new people in and allow new members, or you can help us catch slaves and we'll give you money. Help us catch other slaves. Kind of driving that wedge. And that's what eventually, you know, led to the split up of a lot of black populations on that moral decision which is the European kind of weaving in to cause discord amongst the people. But they had about five prosperous towns that were all inland throughout um, Jamaica that didn't encroach on any of these things, any negotiations with the colonizers. That was just a few of them that were on the fringes, but they had about five prosperous um, cities within that or uh, five prosperous Maroon colonies within that, that was all sparked after the, uh, the Baptist War. And uh, the brother who was involved in that is Samuel Sharp, like I mentioned. Okay, this is in Mau Mau, this is in, in Kenya, and this is brothers on a continent that were fighting back. And this is a fairly new example. This was in the 1950s and 60s. A, a group of black people that wanted to get out of European colonization that fought back. They sometimes call it the Mau Mau Revolt, the Mau Mau Rebellion. But they use strategy and tactics in understanding the land, and they fought back against their colonizers. That's what they did. They didn't just sit back and take the colonization in Kenya. They fought back. And that's called the Mau Mau. Your next example, this one you're probably familiar with, this is North Sentinel Island. This was the island that is, uh, it's a small island near India, and they haven't been under any formal colonization, quote unquote formal colonization. 
But what they ended up doing is um, anytime white people came there, they actually killed them. Like that one white guy that came um, and tried to give him a Bible. This was a few months ago, tried to come with the Bible and he got killed right, right there on the island because they understood that Europeans coming there to either give them a religion or give them, quote unquote, humanitarian aid would be ultimately detrimental to them. So they, they killed them as soon as they got on the shores. And if you see the Sentinel Island people, they look like regular people from California somewhere. Look like regular black people. Okay. Now, here's some modern examples um, with some black Americans. So you figure uh, this was a story. A man hurled racist vitriol in a punch at a FedEx driver, then died when the driver punched him back. So this was a, a, a drunk white guy. Went up to a um, black man, said he was driving too fast in his FedEx truck, cursed him out, you know, called him all types of N-words and whatnot. Um, he, he pulls open the driver's door. Driver gets out like, you know, you need to you need to stop. White guy swings on him. Black dude dips it, hits him one time, one hit a quitter. He fell and hit his head and he killed him. And then tried to play the victim. See? Black people aren't just taking these beatings anymore. The Bay of Pigs, uh, that was an instance, uh, the Cuban invasion, if you wanted to look that up, uh, the United States lost. <laughs> they tried to invade Cuba called the Bay of Pigs, and it was an epic failure. The Battle of Mogadishu in Somalia, they have a movie, the Black Hawk Down movie, another instance in which Black people weren't just going to stand by and take it. The, the black people in Somalia won. Shot down a, um, a United States helicopter. That's, the movie's called Black Hawk Down. So you can go ahead and look that up. I'll put a couple pieces on there, but you know I won't give you, give you too much today. I just wanted to at least put that out there. Some examples of dispelling the myth of the docile African, showing that People didn't just stand by and, and take beatings and take lashings. People were there and they fought back. Okay. African people, descendants of Africans fought back. They didn't just take any of this laying down. And we have to know that and understand it. Because if we don't teach each other this history, then nobody else will. This is stuff that they would, would never talk to you openly about. Why not? Because that would get you to thinking if they could do it back then and it worked, why not do it now? And that's the last thing that they want. They want you to be docile, but I'm here to dispel the myth of the docile African. So I appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you listening. You could have been anywhere on this YouTube campus and you were right here with me. So thank you for your time. And if it's just one person in this classroom listening, then that's a win for me. So I appreciate your time and your energy. Peace and black liberation.